Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Charles Transcribing History Trust show. Um, it's lovely to see you coming back, actually. It's very comforting. So this morning, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Liliana Liebenberg. I'll tell you the technical stuff. She studied linguistics, Afrikaans in general, completed a D-Lit at Phil in the Department of Afrikaans and Dutch at UNISA in 1993. <coughs> From 2001 to 2008, she was involved in two VOC transcription projects. This was one of your questions yesterday. The TANUP and the TEPC. And as a trustee of the Trace and History Trust, she's since managed the VOC Dachrechister project, the current um, VC, which stands for Verbatim Copies, Dachrechister project. And she's a linguist, and she translates, and she edits. She writes academic articles and children's books. She was a co-author of the, oh crikey, there we go, Etymologie voor de Boek van Afrika. <laughs> she wrote stories and tales in the VOC journals, which are available for sale. And she authored Rooswater and Gefeminus van die Roos. She's passionate about roses. Okay. She's written anthologies and spiritual verse. She's my pure alter ego. <laughs> she lectures on language, culture, genealogy, history, and the mystical, <coughs> and is the owner of Tal Ori, which is a website, which is absolutely fascinating. So thank you, Helena. And uh, there are wonderful audience. Yes, I can see that. <laughs> People of the early Cape and what the VCO documents reveal. And for various reasons, people from Western Europe as well as the Far East arrived at the early Cape of Good Hope. Many Westerners served in the VOC service, of course, while the Easterners arrived mainly as slaves and exiles. While we worked on the material containing certain series of VOC documents listed in the Cape Town archives, we made notes of certain individuals who made an impression on the inquiring mind. It was surprising to see how much information could be gathered from the documents. The research material was mostly extracted from the following transcribed uh, VOC series of the 7th century and 18th century. It's the resolutions of the uh, Cape of Council of Policy and the RTEPC project. Uh, it's the inventories and auction rolls of interstate papers, master rolls, and banditen roller. As the religious status of the convicts and exiles was often mentioned or could be derived from the contents, it could also be established that there were Christians, Muslims, and Hindus amongst them. The stories about Angela van Meghalen, the royal princess Doran Passer, and his brother Dita Nagara of Java, then Nicolas Mondaiki of Lombro, and Manuel Tuart of Tutukuri, and then Priya Duplessis of France. <coughs> First, I'm going to talk about the slaves. As there uh, was so much work to be done in this young and growing cap settlement, the continuous development and expansion caused an ever-increasing demand for labor. But some of the koi will only occasionally be used as harvesters and herdsmen. And since there were far too few VOC officials and free burgers to do all the work, the company decided that the only way to solve the problem was to make use of slave labor. That was the only solution to this big problem. The slaves came mainly from the islands of Indonesia, Bengal in the northwestern part of India, the Indian coasts of Coromandel and, and Malabar, from Malaysia, Madagascar, 
and the coasts of Africa, such as Guinea, Angola, and Mozambique. According to the slave traders and owners, the slaves from Madagascar were excellent at agriculture, while the Angolan slaves could do really hard work. The slaves from India and some places in Indonesia were much appreciated for their abilities as craftspeople. All requests by slaves for manumission had to be submitted to the Council of Policy. A slave, male or female, could receive their letter of freedom on condition, there were conditions, that they had to be baptized as a Christian, they could speak Dutch, could either present a healthy and a capable male slave to the company to take their place, or pay the company the amount equal to the value of a young stock strong male slave. The first manumitted slave women were Katrina, Maria, and Angela, all of Bengal. Now, if we look at uh, the case study of Angela of Bengal. Now, uh, the Portuguese arrived in Bengal well before the Dutch and Portuguese Christian missionaries also frequented the mainly hindu -orient oriented Bengal region because the church formed an integral part of the Portuguese Seaborne Empire. I want to show you this first. Um, this is Rugli, the EOC castle at Rugli, and it's on the Ganges in Bengal. Now, um, Angela, her husband Domingo, and their three children had been kidnapped by slave raiders from the Ganges Delta area in the northeast area, area, Indian area known as Bengal. The names Angela and Domingo are of Portuguese origin, an indication of Portuguese influence in their community. That's very really interesting to come back to that later. Now, we are sea commander Peter Kim, a free burger from Italia in Jakarta, so present name is Jakarta, who had also been a magistrate there, sold Angela and her children to Jan van Riebeek and his wife in 1655. They were brought via Matalia to the Cape on board the VOC ship Amersfoort and arrived in Cape Table Bay in late February 1657. This was shortly before the first official slave consignments to the Cape had been sanctioned. But Jan van Liebeek sold Angela and her children to Abraham Gavama just before the Van Liebeek family ordered ship for Batalia in April 1662. <coughs> Now, Gavoma, who was second in command at the Cape, was also promoted to Italia. But before he left, he signed a document in 1666, liberating Angela and her children out of goodwill, a pure genegendheid. Before he left, he asked Thomas Christoffel Muller to look after her for the first six months of his departure. But soon after having gained her freedom, Angela asked for and was granted a plot of land in the Hirnstraat. Uh, in 1668, she made the full transition to Burger society by being baptized as a Christian, because that was one of the conditions. This implies that she was from another re religion, and the only possibility I could think of was that she was a Hindu and converted to Christianity. On 13 December 1669, she married the free burger Arnoldus Willemsen Vasson and eventually became the progenitress of the Vasson family of South Africa. Now Angela, in her lifetime, Angela gave birth to 14 children from four different fathers. <laughs> now you'll see why. Three sons with first husband Domingo in Bengal, that was her, marriage, her first marriage, then four children born from two extramarital relationships at the Cape, while a slave woman. The one relationship was with Bede Quinnan, a son and a daughter, and the other one was Jan van Asser. They had two sons. And then four sons and three daughters with second husband Arnold Vasson. Now while Angela was still in slavery, her daughter Anna de Quinnan was born. Now you'll see Anna de Quinnan. And apart from being very attractive, she was also well educated, and her signature in a firm hand appears on a number of documents that we saw. 
Nou, zien naar mijn Captain Olof Berg. Dat is Olof. En in Huizen became the progenitress of the Berg family of South Africa. But Angela was often called Mai Ansida in the, in the documents, where Dutch Mai is a derivation of Mui, which means aunt in uh, it's a pet name for mother. So that was actually a lovely name to call her. She continued to live the life of a prosperous and respected member of the early Cape society, even after her son had died in 1698. She also attended auctions of deceased estates. And on one occasion, she did what any dummy granny would do by buying some popogood, doll stuff, probably for one of her granddaughters. When she died in 1720, uh, having lived, lived well into her late 70s, her son's original estate had more than doubled to over 14,000 uh, guilders, thanks to this careful management. This was besides her property in the Cape Table Valley, livestock, sl slaves, and two farms, namely Monswijk in Drakenstein and Kroenendal in Hoogwijk. Now we come to our next group, the political exiles as prisoners. Many royals from the east were banished to the Cape after having been sentenced by one of the VOC courts situated in Batavia or Nagapatna, Colombo, Rasamapatna, Samaram, Gali or Cheribon. If they were regarded as dangerous, they were sent to Robin Island. But uh, other exiles from the east were allowed to live either in the fabric settlement Can you guys hear? Yeah. Yeah. Everything okay? Yeah. Now we come to the uh, case study of Pangaran Luran Passer and his brother Pangaran Dipanara. Pangaran means prince. Um, the two of the best known exiles were Pangaran Surya Kasumo, better known as Luran Passer, who arrived at the Cape in 1715, followed by his younger brother Pangaran Dipanara, banished in 1723. Now, some historical facts first. The story begins during the reign of the pro-VOC Emperor Paku Bumana of the Kingdom of Mataram on Java. This Muslim kingdom became a semi-independent vassal state of VOC Batavia, which was unacceptable for Pangaran Luran Pasa and his followers. A feud soon um, erupted between him and his father, the emperor, and when Luren Passer had taken refuge in Semaram, his father accused him of supporting anti-Dutch Surabaya aristocrats and for corroborating with the Lenin's insurgents. The emperor actually authorized his son's execution, but it was later converted to a lifelong sentence at the Cape. Now, Luren Passer and his entourage consisting of his mother, two wives, three sons, mother in law, and eleven servants arrived in Table Bay Lake in 1715. And in 1716, a year after that, the Pangaram and his people were escorted to his assigned abode in Stellenbosch, which was a house and earth on the former Hemrod of the former Hemrod Daniel Fire. Now, according to the description of, in the archival documents, it was possible to determine that the earthen house was situated somewhere between the, um, the Brock in Southern Bosch today, and the Eerste Now, the household was supplied by the VOC with 520 pounds of rice per month at cost price. It was an important part of VOC strategy to leave intact the dietary habits, cultural and religious customs, and practices of political aristocrats exiled the game, in return, of course, for their obedience. Also, the house in Stellenbosch had the external feed running nearby, so as to supply them with water at all times, as required by their customs. 
Furthermore, as with other exiles, it seemed that the VOC allowed the private practice of Islam within the confines of Paso's residence in Stalinbosch. <coughs> it was minuted after his death in June 1737 that all the necessary arrangements had been made to send his mortal remains, as well as his two wives, children and servants, 17 people in all, then back to Batavia. Unfortunately, he never had the opportunity to go back. Now we move back again some 20 years to Deepa Nagara's story. Now, he was the younger brother of Lord Massa, and Deepa is also uh, a royal title, also in the first place. In 1770, two years after Lord Massa was banished, your blessing was spread in Java by the roads of Surabaya and Madura against the Emperor uh, Pakubuana. And then Pakubuana called upon one of his other sons, Pangaran Deepa Nagara, to quell the strife of Kartasura. But instead, Deepa Nagara and his other brother, Deepa Santa, joined the rebellion. Can you imagine? The rebellion collapsed, and by late June 1723, Deepa and other rebels had surrendered to BRC authorities, and he was also exiled to the camp. I'm going to show you an image of Deepa Nagara's letter. You'll see that his name over there, between the red, that we see it's written Deepa Pangara. And then his entourage. And later on, they used the same, the same document, the same image that we have here. And then when they, they returned to the grave, it was written, "Do it, do it, do it." So only a few of them survived, and they could go back. Now, when Deepa Nagara and his entourage arrived at the grave in 1723, they had to join the household of his brother, Mr. Stalinbosch. There were so many people to be fed and to have them. Although he survived his, year, he, he survived his years of banishment, and although the date of his return was not mentioned in the document, it was stated in the applicable document that he returned to the East, and probably it was in the 1750s. We're not sure. But as I say, you can see they wrote there, do it, do it, do it, and only a few of them survived. Sentenced in Colombo and then banished to the Cape. 
Now, um, the St. Christian Tom, uh, St. Thomas Christians are very, uh, that's very interesting. Um, according to tradition, Thomas the Apostle came to Kerala, to the Kerala coast in 52 AD. I have to show this. St. Thomas, as I see him. And um, the community began with Thomas' conversion of four Brahmin families. And during the Crusades, distorted accounts of, this, of the St. Thomas Christians and the Nestorian Church gave rise to the European legend of Prester John. Prester John is also called by that in, in uh, the Netherlands and in Florence. Now the St. Thomas Christians first encountered the Portuguese in 1498 during the expedition of Vasco da Gama. The two groups quickly formed an alliance, and the Portuguese had a keen interest in entrenching themselves in the spice trade and in spreading their, their version of Christianity, and they gained the upper hand, which caused the split in the local church. Having that in mind, we will understand that Angela and Domingo of Bengalan they were also, their names were also influenced by the Portuguese presence. Now this, the next person is the case study of Nicolas Mondaiki. Now Nicolas Mondaiki came from Colombo. It's the present day Sri Lanka, but it used to be Ceylon. You see Colombo is the, uh, the capital of um, Ceylon. And um, he was described, I'm going to explain some of the, you see there his name, his name is written over there, Nicolas Mondaiki. And he was described as a chiti, which means a cashier, and he was a former kanakapur, which means a writer, or bookkeeper and interpreter. And he worked for the honorable preacher, Johan Bernard Noordbeek. Now, Nicolas and another Christian called Patanaika Apuhami. Apuhami is a title of um, respect. It's equal to Sire or Sire. He was uh, a senior master of the Maturis Apuhami School. And they arrived at the Cape in 1728. According to the sentence passed in 1727 by the Council of Justice at the Castle of in Colombo, they were both banished to the Cape for 10 years. And according to a later note written in the margin, they died here while serving their sentence. So you can see it's Ufer Lien, there in Patanaika, Abu Hami's name, just below that it's Ufer Lien, and below Nicolas Mandaiki's name, it's like Ufer Lien. So they actually use the same document to um, read all the information. On the, in Ondaiki's case, this can be verified by his inventory, dated on the 2nd of September 1737, and his auction list dated on um, 5 November 1737. That was also uh, some of the work that we transcribed, of course. He had very few possessions, of which one lot was sold at the house of Jacob van Allen, and the second lot on the farm of Daniel Walters. The latter consisted of one pair of trousers, a jacket, handkerchief, and two books. I think the most important two books. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the files of the MOC 14 um, series that we also did, we indexed that, contains letters on and other documents revealing much about Von Dijk's personal life during his nine years at the Cape. The documents written by Von Dijk were done in a neat and orderly manner, while his steady handwriting bears evidence of a well-educated man. 
Dutch. From his correspondence, it is clear that he was fluent in Dutch, both written and spoken. And he was a teacher who gave lessons to the Nidhogger children and some other children in the district, yeah, in that okay. And he was a respected free man. He was called a Freiswater at the Cape. Now, one of the most precious findings was a sub file containing incoming letters from Colombo and Gali, listed annually from 1728 till 1735. In other words, neatly sorted according to date. Now you'll see what I mean. And it was written in Singhalese. You can see the, the image, is, it's not so very clear, but at least you can see it's a different type of uh, writing from ours. And um, in the upper left hand corner of each letter, Wondamaki himself wrote in Western script the name of the sender and the person's place of residence. For instance, from my mother, Juliana Wondamaki Colombo. Juliana Ondaiki Colombo. And also from Frank van Willem Jurgen Ondaiki Colombo. And you see a little memory book, a little miniature book. That was where he wrote all the, the lessons and the dates and everything that he gave to the young children and the other children. So that was that was the Dutch, of course. And what a surprise it was to read in the BOC Cape Journal much later than this day, the Cape Journal of 1757 about a certain Reverend Willem Julian Mondaiki leading two servants at the Cape. So he was that reformed. He arrived on the ship Rosenberg and was on his way to take up his duty as a clergyman in the service of the BOC. Perhaps he was the son of this same Willem Jochen von Daiki, relative of the Nicolas von Daiki, could be. No, most of them, no, they lived in the, um, he, he wasn't in prison. He was actually a free man, that's why he could move around and give uh, lessons and so on. But as most of them, as you'll hear from the next second, the next case, they lived in the state lodge. But they were not in prison. Sometimes they, they had to be sent to, to Robben Island if they committed some crime or so. And otherwise they were in, living in the state lodge. They, they were actually regarded then as slaves because they worked for the BOC. Can I ask you that the BOC, these places,
sorry, very briefly, I don't mean to interrupt the flow. The, 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 the source of uh, Angolan and Madagascan slaves was very often um, defeated enemies and Arab slave trade. Um, what is the primary source of Indonesian slaves? Where they come from? Through what purpose? How did they become slaves? I'm not sure because it could be, as, we, as we've heard, they could have been slave traders in yeah. India, willing to sell. I don't know whether they were from um, the untouchables. I don't know. Okay. I was thinking about that. If you can give me. Because uh, no, the African, I don't know. No, African recipe was easy. If you oh, it was so de terrible. defeated, or you were a nuisance, yeah. or a criminal, or service to needs, you, know, when you went to a sale. Whenever we do these transcriptions, it's so sad, especially yeah. the people coming from Madagascar. You know, they, they died of, of fear and of, oh, it was, it was terrible. Thank and you. as you say, it was the um, Arabic influence. They were there as well. Because you read everything when you try and do the transcriptions. Wonderful source of information. And now the, the, the next case study that was also really interesting. We also have um, St. Thomas Christian, and he was called Manuel Tuat, or Tuat. You can hear Manuel is Portuguese. Tuat, Tuat in Afrikaans as well, you can have that surname. Tuat, Tuat actually. And then it was actually Duarte. And we have the Duartes in the cave as well. Mm -hmm. so that was very really interesting, but it was written as Tuart. It was spelled more, it was Dutch. Many of these names were actually Dutch. And then one of the most intriguing adventures uh, belongs to Manuel Duart, and it's spelled in so many ways. So if you want to do a search on Manuel Duart, it's better to look for Manuel, because they never use another spelling variation than Manuel. Um, he arrived uh, in 1747 on the ship Schaibiek. But he was called a Parua from Tutukurin. I'll show you where that is. Tutukurin is over there. It's, it's in the, um, the white circle. Now, um, uh, Manuel was a company prisoner who stayed in the slave lodge. That will answer your, one of your questions. He belonged to the Parua caste. They were a group of local inhabitants who were St. Thomas Christians as well. And the Parua's came from the coast of Madura. So they were on an Indian side, not near Sri Lanka. Near Sri Lanka, but not it's on the, it's in India. And they specialized in pearl diving. Now due, uh, due to its once thriving natural pearl diving industry, Tutu Kurin is still known today as, as Mutu Nagaram, which means pearl city. Now, in uh, 1747 or 46, five Parwasan pearl divers, including Dwight, had been sentenced in the castle of Colombo to be flogged, branded, chained, and banned to the Cape for 25 years. Mm -hmm. They were accused of having planted the pearl banks and trying to sell the pearl oysters. That was unforgivable. Because it was money. Parua Manuel Duhart was expected to earn his own living at the Cape and to serve as a company diver. Now, um, in 1755, he had his chance to show his skill when the ship Guinness felt developed a leak near his keel on the starboard side, and the officials did not know how to repair it. They realized that they needed the services of a capable diver to look for the leak underwater, and then they remembered Monroe Tuart. On two consecutive day, days, he dived seven times, staying underwater between five to six minutes to obtain a good look at both sides of the ship. And according to him, the crevice in the hull could be repaired from the inside. Because Stuart acquitted himself so well of that task, 
the Council of Policy decided that he would no longer be regarded as a convict. And Governor Tolbach agreed to the recommendation that he would receive 30 Rix dollars as an enumeration. But soon afterwards, Manuel was also appointed as a member of the expedition that sailed to Mozambique with the ship Schreidenberg. The expedition was tasked with recovering the money and the other precious goods belonging to the ship Redenhof, who had stranded there some time earlier. And at a council meeting in February 56, it was minuted that the search had been in vain. But unfortunately, Tuart's good service did not earn him his freedom. After some time, all but Manuel himself had forgotten about the uh, governor's concession. In 1761, while Tilbach was still governor, Manuel is still listed as one of the convicts living in the slave lodge. Everybody forgot about that. In the slave lodge register, it was noted that the Kluke Bandite Jungen, Manuel Dual, died on 9th of August 1782. So he remained there until his death. Now the last uh, case study was done on uh, a refugee from Europe. And who could that be? The revocation of the Edict of Nantes by the Catholic King of France not only had serious consequences for France and its neighboring countries, but it also had an influence on the, um, on the composition of the population of the Cape. Um, now all of you know the, the history of the Huguenots, I'm not going to expand on that. But in 1692, a total of 201 French Huguenots had already settled at the Cape, most of them on farms in what is known as France Hook, the France Hook, the French Corner. Many farms still bear their original French names. But some of the Huguenots who settled at the Cape were well educated for their time, and practice important professions. Um, now, the case study deals with Jean Pierre de Bessy. Now, he was born at Poitiers, near Paris, in 1638. He was already 50 years old when they, he arrived uh, at the Cape on board of the Western in 1688, when the mainstream of humanists arrived at the Cape. He was married to Madeleine Menanto also from Poitiers. Their first child, Charles, was born on board ship, and the second child, also a son, Jean-Louis, was born in, 16, in 1691. Now, he received practice as a chirurgeon, that means a surgeon or medical practitioner, but he was also a farmer. A year after the family's arrival at the Cape, an incident occurred during which one of his countrymen, Charles Marie, was injured and later died of complications caused by the wound. Marie was attacked by some boy, one named Duko or Elisa, who refused to their request to pick some watermelon growing um, on his piece of land. Because according to Marie, the victim after uh, the fruit was still not ripe. The cook first threw a watermelon at him and then hit him on the right thigh with a stone. Unfortunately, this wound had infected and caused Marie's death. Now then, the Council of Policy requested the surgeon to proceed to investigate the event and conduct a post-mortem uh, on the victim. Then he submitted the official report, and that's very interesting because he wrote in um, 17th century French. If you read, it's very interesting. It's a bit difficult you know, for the French African today to understand. Um, and in 1694, Jean Pierre, accompanied by his wife and two sons, returned to Europe, where Madeleine died shortly after their arrival. And at 60 years, he married Marie Bouisset of Sedan, with whom he returned to the Cape in 1702 and again settled in Southern Bosch. Mr. Bosch, that time looks like this. Smaller. This was drawn in 1710. And Jean Pierre de Pussy passed away in 1708 at the age of 70. Now, conclusion. It was possible to construct the case studies for this presentation by using information 
dealt mainly from the very scarcity series mentioned earlier. What was most revealing, however, is that in all the cases, uh, is that all the cases could be enriched by considering not only the circumstances under which and reasons why these individuals arrived at the Cape, but also by observing their different religious beliefs and the role these viewpoints could play. Although and, uh, Angela von Benchala was probably raised as a Hindu, it was quite possible that she had knowledge of the Christian belief system, and the reason being that the teachings of St. Thomas had already been known for, in India for more than 1,700 years at that time. It was also the faith held by the various Western powers that had all of a sudden arrived on India's doorstep, the Christian belief system. When she had to choose between a freedom as a converted Christian or probably remaining a Hindu slave, she seamlessly could make the transition and could then become an acknowledged member of the Cape society. Now the two Muslim royals, Princess Adoran Pasan and Deepan Agara, were both exiled for political reasons. The fact that they were not sent to Rome Island was proof that they were not regarded as a threat to social stability at the Cape. And for that reason, they were allowed to stay in Salenbosch and could mingle freely with the local community. Then um, they could attend auctions. Deepa Nagara bought quite a few items. And they could travel to and from the Cape settlement and so on. They could also practice their religion without any restriction. And their needs were attended to, for instance, by supplying them at all times with fresh running water as we acquired by their culture, and I believe by their religion as well. The fact that both Nicolas Mudaiki and Manuel Tuart were some Christian top, some Thomas Christians could be the reason why they were treated with relatively leniency by the POC. That, that was my feeling, it's not to say it's true. Mudaiki was described as a free black in the documents and could move freely around in the Cape colony and work as a teacher. He was well educated, respected, and also regarded as an equal, not as a convict. Manuel Tewart was treated somewhat differently, and although he enjoyed some freedom by being officially recognized as a driver in VOC service, he had to remain in the slave lodge. Even if it was only for a while, he was unexpectedly he unexpectedly gained the favor of Governor Tulbach by rendering a service that no European could perform. The fact that he was a St. Thomas Christian could have contributed to the more cordial treatment that he received. Now, the French refugee, Jean Pierre de Bussy, is the only European case in this presentation. And tragically, in spite of the fact that members of the two groups uh, were often, sh often shared the same lineage and heritage, he, as as a Protestant and his fellow believers were persecuted by the Catholic Church for their reformed views. For example, Duplessis' cousin was, was Cardinal de Richelieu, who known for his relentless persecution of the Protestants. Duplessis had no criminal record, he was no enemy of the state, but an ally with much needed skills as a surgeon and also as a later on as a farmer. Knowing the terrible consequences of being pers persecuted, it seems as if many of the Huguenots tended to show mercy on people in general, of whom the slaves and the poor were examples that we noted in the documents. Thank you so much for listening.
whatever he was born, he was uh, he was from the from East and from Europe and so on. But then we got that from from the top. I mean, it was the VOC who decided what they were allowed to do in a yeah. free society. Yeah. Sometimes I did, because they didn't even discriminate against the Lutherans because they were not in the of the church. That was also really interesting. The Lutherans had such a, a battle because it happened in 17, somewhere in the early 80s, 1780s, when the Lutherans could have their own church. <coughs> they were allowed their own church in they were Cologne. Oh, in Salon, Salon. Yeah. from 1740. It's just at the Cape. Not just at the Cape. Yes. They discriminated against God. Against and of course, it raises the interesting question as to what were they protecting themselves? What was the VOC officials protecting themselves against? Some of them were Lutheran. Yeah, that was Lutheran. Yeah, that was very interesting. Many of them were Lutherans, but they. they I didn't have the freedom to go to, to, to the church, to the church, to all the church, and that's where this, uh, the church in uh, the Lutheran church in France, that's where it comes from. The first time that Martin Mel had the opportunity, then he actually started to live. Yes? On Marcia and Duarte, did they have offspring? No, unfortunately, no, they died. They, they, they died, they didn't get married. Neither, neither one died to you nor um, one else. They, they don't mention it, but not them died to you. You were sick. What's that? Why? Just because it was far away? Yeah, it was far away. Far enough. And sometimes if they do something wrong here, they were posted to the table. <laughs> they were exiled to the table, but also happened. Many, many of, of, of the Westerners say it was, it was, it was a sailor or something and he did something terribly wrong. Then he was exiled to, to the east, never to return to the table. And he's written like that. Nooit weer terug te keer naar die kop. He was verband van in die kop. For Yuvach. Yuvach look for one. So he could never come back. I'm intrigued by this term St. Thomas Christian. Yeah, you should hear um, it. I can see it as a as sort of a leftover of Portuguese Catholicism in India. Um, but, you know, the, the religious intolerance of the VOC and the insistence on, on Protestant. Uh, Protestantism mm -hmm. and the really hard time the Catholics had establishing themselves in the Cape. Um, where does St. Thomas Peter out, and when you simply become a, um, a, a Christian for manumission purposes without St. Thomas? We well, have St. Thomas in mind, okay. and then you decide to become a Christian. <laughs> So that, that, that could help. I think that could help. Because that must lead to that too, right? Okay. To, be, to be a St. Thomas Christian. Because at least you know about Christianity. Not only in the Muslim Okay. The, the, the church that St. Thomas was supposed to have founded was very ancient. Very, very yes. And it's far yes. older than the arrival of the Portuguese. Oh, yes. It's called the Martoma Church. Okay. And I think it's roughly like some of the Orthodox churches, yeah. but the point is it's a very old Christian community in South India. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the Portuguese succeeded in yes, They were very clever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a descendant of Angela. I'm oh, wondering yes. how many other of my family are here. <laughs> 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 and then second question, the number of the publications talk about Domingo as being Angola, mm -hmm. which could make sense because Domingo is also a Portuguese man, I'm not quite sure then it's Angola, no, but Portuguese took over Angola, but, uh, but according to your book, he was also from Bengal. It seems as if it could be true because um, she and her husband and the three children came yeah. yeah. But I've seen some publications which seem to think it was in the other way. Thank you.